What therefore God hath joined, let no man put asunder. Words from today's Holy Gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In the Second World War, two men escaped from the Japanese as they invaded the Philippines. One was an Air Force captain, the other an Army sergeant. They found a leaky, handcrafted boat, and through enemy-held waters, enemy territory, they carefully made their way to Australia. Their ordeal lasted ten months. Since the sergeant was more knowledgeable about the sea and boats and things of that nature, the captain gave over his rank, his command, and willingly subjected himself to the sergeant, his fellow countrymen, even though he clearly outranked him. Not surprisingly, they had various disagreements along the way. Such that there were days and even a week or more at a time when there was silence in the boat. They would not talk to each other. Yet the captain submitted himself to the sergeant as he had agreed to do at the beginning. They also had many close calls, enduring a savage two-day typhoon, close encounters with numerous enemy ships, mines, sharks, and one treacherous Nazi collaborator. They received a final strafing as their boat reached Australia, set the boat on fire, but they made it safe and sound. And when they reached the shore, they looked at each other, they thanked and congratulated each other, and they laughed heartily. We made it. Having reached their destination safe and sound, all the old differences and disagreements melted away And they seemed rather trivial. In many ways, this image typifies married life. Two people, namely a man and a woman, bind themselves to live faithfully together in one boat. Never to leave that vessel. No matter what happens. Always open to new members, open to life wanting to help God populate heaven, always aiming and rowing for heaven, working for the salvation of those in the boat, children and each other, come what may. At times, the one in charge, the man, the husband, the father, seems maybe the least talented of the group maybe the least insightful at times. Yet he's the head of the ship. On the other hand, many times the wife is more talented and more observant in some ways than her husband, symbolized by the captain outranking the sergeant. But according to how God made things, how he made the universe hierarchical, as we heard in the lesson, She submits to the husband in order to make it to the other shore, just as the captain submitted to the sergeant. We have to submit to the system God gave us. It's our archical system. God places the couple in one boat, as it were, because they need each other to reach the distant shore of heaven. Once there, once there, all will be revealed All will make sense. All the differences will melt away. And they'll be filled with joy such that the wife can say to her husband, I can thank you that I have a strong support in life and that I have such good children. And likewise, the husband can say to his wife, I can thank you that I have had such an understanding life companion and such a peaceful home. But the greatest joy of all will be that they can say to each other, I can thank you that I have attained eternal life. Today, more and more young people, more and more good people are afraid to get married. They do not think they can stay in what appears to be a leaky, handcrafted boat or endure all the trials, the sharks, the mines, the waves, the storms, the enemy prowling around in warships trying to sink them and destroy them. 
false friends betraying them, and most of all, those disagreements and misunderstandings that are inevitable in every marriage. Surely the captain had second thoughts many times during his trip. He probably thought, why did I do this? Why did I give over my command? I should be in charge. What are the alternatives? Well, for the captain and the sergeant, it was capture, imprisonment, starvation, torture, and most likely death. If we're going to make it to the shore of heaven, folks, we have to risk something for God. We have to risk something. Today, few women submit themselves to their husbands as the captain submitted himself to that sergeant. Today, few husbands understand what it means to lead a family. What is more, we see around us many good people trying to live a faithful marriage, and yet they end up abandoning ship or sinking, even when this seemed most unlikely at the start. What a couple they made, we say to ourselves. A perfect match. They seem to have it all. What happened to them? What is more, there's a deep mystery underlying Catholic marriages. Namely, that husband and wife symbolize the union between Christ and His beloved bride, the church. As many are aware, the Holy Church, the bride of Christ, is passing through an unprecedented trial. A passion. A time of great scourging and suffering. And that means that marriages will reflect the passion of the church. Catholic marriages will be under attack. The institution of marriage will be under attack because the church is under attack. So the marriages will reflect the passion of the church. They too will be put to the test for the sake of the church they represent They too are called to fill up in their bodies, in their marriages even, and their families. Those things that are wanting to the sufferings of Christ for His body, which is the church, St. Paul, Colossians 1.24. How many are prepared for this awesome responsibility? Let's face it, few. Thus, not surprisingly, the institution of marriage and its elevation as a sacrament are undergoing a great trial in our time. As a result, many are fearful of even entering into such a lifelong bond. Into what looks like a leaky, handcrafted boat, only to enter upon rough and hostile seas filled with enemies and dangers. Again, we must risk something for God. Why? Because God will supply He will not let you down. He wonderfully provides the solution to this problem. He knows our weaknesses. He shows us what to do such that we can stay in the boat, come what may, and make it to the shores of heaven together, come what may. He shows us what to do so that our holy marriages will represent Christ's indissoluble love for His bride, the Holy Catholic Church. And the solution is very simple. You do what He does. Well, what does God do? Before answering that, we must recognize that God loves us so much that He married us. He married us in Christ. So wonderfully and mysteriously uniting our human nature to His divine nature in one person. That's called the hypostatic union. In the person of the Word, the Son of God, He united the divine nature and the human nature. This hypostatic union of God and man in Christ is the bond of perfection. An indissoluble bond. This is the New Testament. This is the New Covenant. Well, what does God do with His covenants? He puts them in arcs. What does He do with this perfect marriage bond. He places it in the living ark, in the living womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. 
That's what Christmas is all about. When St. John looked up at the shore of heaven and it opened up before him, you can read about it in the Apocalypse, chapter 11, verse 19. What did he see? Heaven opened up. He saw the Ark of the Covenant in heaven. Folks, that's not the woodcrafted box overlaid with gold made by Moses. That's the living body of the Blessed Virgin Mary. It's the assumption. Think of Our Lady of Guadalupe. 1531, she came to Mexico with Jesus in her womb. Living Ark. So, what does God do? He places His covenants in arcs for safekeeping. He did this symbolically in the Old Testament by placing the very heart of the old law, the Ten Commandments, in the Ark of the Covenant made by Moses that was lost on Mount Nebo in a cave. 2 Maccabees chapter 2. You can read about it. Previous to that, there was Noah's Ark. It survived the flood. We must imitate God by placing our covenants, our baptismal vows, our marriage vows. For me, my religious vows, our priestly vows, we place them in the ark for safekeeping. And the Lord will be there with them. How do we do this? By total consecration to Jesus living in Mary. Think about it. The ark, as St. John saw, is in heaven. It's assumed into heaven, body and soul. The devil cannot touch its contents. If ever he tries, Genesis 3.15 is fulfilled. He gets his head crushed. Also, not to be forgotten, St. Joseph is the human spouse of Mary. He the is called the terror of demons and the defender of Holy Church. And He will be around to protect her and everything she loves. Everything that she has protection of. Everything she holds dear. For maximum protection. This consecration should be renewed daily by meeting before the ark frequently to keep it active. And this we do by praying the rosary together daily. By doing this, we, as it were, stir up the graces that are due to us from this sacrament. St. Paul tells St. Timothy, stir up the graces of your ordination. Stir up the graces of your matrimonial bond. Pray the rosary together. Come before the ark. And you will receive the graces you need. We stir up the graces that belong to us. If we do this, some amazing things follow. When we're in trouble, struggling with trials, we go to the ark to find some graces that we need to calm us, to enlighten us, and strengthen us. Think about it. When Moses went through that desert with those stiff-necked people of old, when he was struggling, what did he do? He went to the ark, and he received everything he needed to make it. You can do the same. That was just a symbol of the Blessed Virgin, that old ark. This is the real thing. The Lord came down upon the ark. He overshadowed it. He spoke to Moses. And He strengthened him. You have a greater than Moses here. His Majesty, Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords, is living in this ark. Furthermore, the spouse of the Blessed Virgin, at least by analogy, is the Holy Ghost. He overshadowed her at the Annunciation and at Pentecost. He likes to overshadow her. This is where the apostles receive the Holy Ghost in abundance. He will come. He will come for you too if you go there. He is the bonding agent of God. Where He is present, love will not fail. He is the love of God. The bond of the Father and the Son. Now if we do this, and we renew our vows in consecration daily, then no sharks, no mines, no foul weather, no disagreements, no enemies trying to sink the boat will stop us. Place your marriage bond in the ark. 
seeking always to stir up the graces of marriage daily, and the shores of heaven will be yours. And what a victory it will be. Again, there, once there, once on those shores, all will be revealed, all will make sense, all differences will melt away. Filled with joy, the wife can say to her husband, I can thank you that I have a strong support in life and that I have such good children. And likewise, the husband can say to his wife, I can thank you that I have such an understanding life companion and such a peaceful home. But greatest joy of all will be that they can say to each other, I can thank you that I have attained eternal life. Now, having started this sermon with an example from world history, let us end with an example from the lives of the early martyrs. I have a newlywed couple in mind, Saints Timothy and Mara. True story. They died in mid-December in the 300s. At the turn of the 4th century, this is their story. It's happened in the Middle East. Timothy was married. She was a lector. Timothy was married to a Christian lady named Mara, only 17 years of age. And the marriage had been solemnized but three weeks when Arianus, the governor of the province, issued an order for the arrest of Timothy. Maybe we'll be getting some more of those soon, huh? Who had been represented to him as one of the greatest enemies of the gods. You're an enemy of the state. When the latter was presented, Ariana said to him, Art thou not aware of the edicts of the emperors against those who refuse to sacrifice to idols? You mean you don't accept homosexual unions? Timothy answered, I am aware of them, but would rather lay down my life than commit such an act of impiety. Then said the governor, We shall put thee to the torture and hear how thou wilt speak during the infliction. The saint resolutely refused to comply, and the barbarous tyrant caused many horrible tortures to be visited upon Timothy. Seeing, however, that torments had no effect on him, he sent for Mara and told her that she alone could save her husband from death, as by her tears she might induce him to sacrifice to the gods. She went accordingly to the place and seeing him so piteous in so piteous a condition, endeavored to induce him to give in. It's not that big of a deal, Timothy. Timothy replied, How is it possible, O Mara, that being thyself a Christian, instead of animating me to die for the faith, thou dost tempt me to abandon it? And thus to obtain a short and miserable existence here, expose myself to never-ending pains of hell. Is this then thy love, O Mara? Is this not precisely what most Catholics are doing today? Trying to get their fellow Catholics to give up, come down, stop fighting the world, the flesh, and surrender. It's not that bad. Let them have their unions. Get fixed. Either temporarily or permanently. We've had enough children. It's not about populating heaven. It's about having fun here on earth. Mara was instantly converted by this rebuke from her head and casting herself on her knees, besought her blessed Lord with many penitent tears to forgive her. She then asked pardon of her husband and exhorted him to remain firm in his profession of faith, expressing at the same time a desire to sacrifice her life in atonement for her fault and be the happy companion of his martyrdom. Timothy, much consoled by the repentance of his wife, told her that her last words had caused him to forget his past sufferings and that she should forthwith return to the governor to retract her first step and express her desire of dying for Jesus Christ. Mara at first was afraid to trust her own weakness, but Timothy prayed for her so effectually that the Lord granted her grace and strength to execute the orders of her pious husband. The governor, surprised at her sudden change, endeavored to dissuade her from her holy purpose by promising to obtain for her an advantageous match. I'll find you a rich husband. 
But Mara replied that after his death, or after the death of her husband, she would have no other spouse than Jesus Christ. Hereupon, Arianus caused her hair to be violently pulled out, her fingers cut off, after which she was too, she too was horribly tortured, from which, however, she came out amazingly uninjured. God healed her. Arianus was so much affected by this miracle that he converted some days later. But in the meantime, he sentenced them both to be crucified. While she was proceeding to the place of execution, her mother, shedding many tears, embracing her, but the saint, freeing herself from her parents' embrace, hastened to the cross. Husband and wife were crucified, one opposite the other, and they encouraged each other from their crosses with the hope that they would soon be united to Jesus in heaven. And they died, and they became saints. Now they're able to say to each other, I thank you that I have attained eternal life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.